truth is usually stranger than fiction. The purpose of these shows are not to scare you, but to prepare you, because what you don't know could hurt you. The word says in Hosea 4.6, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. Thank you for joining us. My name is Julie, and here is the host of the show, Barry Meyer. In the end time talk radio. A lot of things happening in our country here, of course, also the world. And sitting in studio with us is um, we have a former IRS auditor, um, Michael McCune. And um, he won seven out of eight U.S. Supreme Court cases. Um, this is going to be some interesting things here tonight. I really want you to really listen. Some of it may be overhead, and so we're going to try to delve in and make it as easy to understand. Um, there's so many things that are happening that you don't hear in the news, and when you do hear about it, you probably don't understand what's going on. So Michael's going to explain um, some things tonight. And I think, Michael, we're going to probably try to have you on more often just because of everything that's going on here in our country. Events are speeding up. Yeah. Michael, why don't you go ahead and give a small little background about yourself so people kind of grasp an idea of where you came from. <laughs> uh, I uh, worked uh, to get a degree in uh, economics and then, of course, back in the 70s, if there wasn't a whole lot of demand unless you wanted to go to New York or and work on the stock exchange or got into government. Well, when I got into government, I found out auditing was better for me than uh, <laughs> than being an economist. And uh, I worked at that job for uh, 16 years in various capacities. And then um, 1992, uh, midway through the year, I just decided I'd had enough and said, adios. I'll <laughs> I was on vacation and Never came, never went back. Wow, I bet you never regretted that. Not much. Uh, there's there's some regrets. I left some stuff go. Um, I had done some testimony uh, trying to get them to change uh, the way that the the laws were being written, or to to get them to see that the tax uh, burden was was simply out of control. Mm -hmm. And instead, uh, the way I said it, uh, because I'm not a not a, a gifted uh, influential person uh, with the powers that be, they they basically were happy to see me go. Oh, um, well, I know that when you're you because you're on a radio show in defense of a nation. Yes, and that's with Stan and Stephen Grant out of Greeley. Maybe talk about that uh, a few minutes or, or so about what that's all about. We're trying to prepare people for how the Bible teachings are alive and well today, and actually are are tying into current events mm -hmm. in the things that uh, some of the prophets, which most of the main street religions skip over because they're uncomfortable to talk about. And we try to show how those things are tying into today's events. Yeah, I really enjoy it. I always, there's some things I really just, I had to listen three, four, five times. Yes. It's so good. And, you know, so often I forget the date. So today is May 21st of 2014. Um, people can go to In Defense of a Nation on YouTube and listen to those shows that way. Yeah, probably even um, starting tomorrow night, you'll get the current one because we, we will tape the show tomorrow. It's for actual for public consumption on uh, supposedly for Sunday. But since the YouTube and stuff, uh, we we're, we're able to put it out right away. Yeah. Well, Michael, um, let's go ahead and get into what's currently growing on in our country here. Um, now, in front of me, you gave me a list of some stuff, and I think this is great. And, of course, you know how we, we, people can run on rabbit trails, which is good because, you know, I'll ask questions that will go on even beyond this. Sure. Um, but how about let's start off with the topic that you have on here, Social Security problem and the government insolvency. Yeah, what first caught my eye was, of course, the government has changed the name. It's no longer Social Security mm -hmm. as a program that was reserved for the citizens of this country, but it is now called an entitlement program. Okay. And the reason they had to do this, of course, first of all, the permanent trust fund, they squandered. That's how they balanced the, the budget during Bill Clinton's years. Uh, but what they've done now is the, the expenses for Social Security are exceeding their current 
yearly intake. Mm-hmm. And so they have, they're operating at a deficit okay. that's adding to our debt. But because they have put so many people on that have never worked or have not worked enough to really earn benefits, they put them on social, uh, social security disability program. The disability aspect, there's 11 million now receiving disability. I've seen that. And that is pulling the whole system even farther into the red. Mm -hmm. And it is threatening to collapse the payments because now it's getting to the point where they're actually starting to have to pay out more in a month than they are expected to take in for the whole year. Wow. That's big. That's big. And again, as long as the interest rates on that debt, they can rig the rates and keep them down low. It's not that big of a deal. But if rates get even begin to creep up back towards normal, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden, the amount of debt service that we owe on our outstanding debt exceeds our income take for the whole, because they they take in about $2.9 trillion in all, but they're still spending $4 trillion a year. Mm -hmm. You know, know, it's a scary thought that more money is going out, because my mom... Um, she just started on Social Security here a couple of years ago. And, you know, of course, now she has a job to su- help supplement. The thing is, if Social Security is cut off, which we could see it with the EBT cards. Exactly. And yeah. the problem is, if they run out of money and decide that they can't print anymore, if they need to take back or, or increase their income, then that could lead to other problems. But the biggest thing is, they're almost looking right now, and this this is one of those what if situations. Mm-hmm. What if they are considering? I'm when I, they I'm talking about the government gets in a financial bind and has to reduce the benefit package for this entitlement now. Sure. Now it's not something that you've earned because you've worked. It's not something that you paid into. What it'll basically amount to is that they've stolen more money from you even than they you thought they were through your regular taxes. Medicare uh, and Medicaid are in the same shape, and once again, that's also part of the FICA tax that comes out of your payroll. I know, it's, and it's amazing. When I worked overtime, it just seemed like they took even more of my overtime. So why was it even worth working the overtime? Yeah, you don't gain that much. Yeah. Um, and, and again, that's one of the problems. Gee, guess what? They're looking at one of the... One of the things they're looking at is cutting the overtime. Unless you is a full time employee, and they can work overtime, but if you're a part time employee, now they're saying, "Oops, that's a problem." You're going to have to reclassify them so that we can now count them against it. And now, oops, you fall under Obamacare. Oh, I see. You know, my company, it, it's a, it's one of the Fortune 500s. It's a pretty big company. I haven't seen a lot of the stuff yet come down. Um, of course, you know how bigger companies can absorb more than a smaller company. When will I start seeing things in these bigger companies start come that'll be affecting us? January first of uh, fifteen of fifteen, and the reason that is, that's when Obamacare for the employers kick in. Mm-hmm. But don't forget, they have to apply that tax or apply the rate against what happened to them the prior year. So there's going to be a full year's wait before they'll give you an estimated bill or give your the companies an estimated bill in 2015. But the actual stuff won't come through until 2016 so that the people that are doing the, make, making that, they can judge whether or not the penalty is worth paying compared to what they have to pay otherwise. And right now the penalty is so small, yeah. I yeah. think there'd be more more companies are going to opt out and yeah. say, okay, employees, you're on your own. One of the things I noticed um, when we got a pay raise at work, um, they only gave people a seven cent raise. <laughs> like someone said, well, that's a real kick in the teeth. I'll go back um, 1967 uh-huh. here in Cheyenne. The uh, Teamsters Union held out for a nickel an hour more. Really? And uh, Ringsby Truck Lines was the first one. Um, I did some intern work uh, with Ringsby Truck Lines with uh, Neil Hendrickson, and and, uh, he was their chief accountant. But back then, I can remember 
them coming down and the meeting with the Teamsters uh, here in, in Cheyenne, they had just built a brand new terminal in Cheyenne. And Johnny Spears was the head of the local union, and he fly got up and told his guys, vote to go on strike if they don't give us this nickel because he's, he can't walk away from the investment that he's got. Mm-hmm. Don Ringsby, uh, I had, like I say, I had helped work out some of the problems on that. Don Ringsby got up and says, guys, we have worked on it every way we can. If I give you a nickel an hour, I am losing money every every hour that we operate a vehicle. On every vehicle, I have to close the doors. They mm-hmm. voted for the nickel raise. He closed the doors and never reopened. Mm-hmm. It's, it's one of those things that you have to, well, if it doesn't work, if it doesn't make financial sense, Businesses are going to close. They're going to go away. Well, this is the situation we've got right now, particularly with Obamacare. Um, when it first came out and when they, I first read the bill as it was uh, written, I estimated that the CBO had made a major mistake, mm-hmm. that it was going to cost Americans a trillion dollars a year more. Mm-hmm. They said it was going to be a trillion dollars over 10 years. Sure. As you can see with the errors, the, the redos, and all this stuff that they're having to do, the fact that they still haven't got people to pay for it. They've got $8 million registered, but only $2 million have paid for it. It's not going to work. Mm-hmm. It's not going to work. Now, it's going to set up a two-tier system in America for health care. Those that can afford to go outside the system and buy better health care, and those that are stuck in, it's going to make a, it's just going to make the 1% a different class even more so than what they what it is right now. Before I forget, that reminds me, you do a letter called The Rent that yes. people can actually, and you, you just talked about the 1%. Yes. So um, maybe mention a little bit about The Rant before I forget. Uh, <laughs> the Rant started as a psychological tool. Mm-hmm. Um, a few years back, they said I had anger issues, depression, whatever you want to call it, but it was because of anger. And therefore, I should write, keep a daily log and write my frustrations down. Uh, After a couple of months of that, the psychologist said, you know, um, this is pretty good stuff. You ought to put this out for public consumption. Yeah. So I began posting it, um, people that would request it. And first I sent it out to family and friends, and so it kind of grew. But it really is just anger, uh, things that... You don't get on the on the general news or things that they miss that I feel are important, and I bring those up and tie dots together that they don't even think of. As an example, 12 days ago, I put together the uh, problems in the Veterans Administration with Obamacare and showed how they were exactly the same, mm-hmm. that the death panels, because they're counting pennies, how that was going to work out, and it what was strange, it wasn't until this just this past Monday, two days ago, that the Fox News, Rush Limbaugh and those guys also began talking about it in the same terminology mm-hmm. of how those tie together, where the death panels actually come in. So people are reading the rant. Mm-hmm. People are aware of it. It's just not got wide acceptance because I am so far outside of mainstream that they're going, here comes that nut again. Yeah. Uh, Bill Maurer, actually, on one of his shows, referred to me. This was several years back, but he called me the oxygen-deprived cowboy uh. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, he said he, here he goes again. Uh, yeah. But it's it's the things that I write about, most of the time they come true or most of the time the people that read it can actually say, wait a minute, this is something that mm-hmm. I've seen in my daily life. Well, you, you're a numbers person. I yes. Mean, well, not only are you a numbers with, with with government, but I've seen how you figure even baseball. Yes. I mean, it was amazing, and I don't quite I don't understand it, but you're able to understand things about baseball that normally most people wouldn't understand, the things how you look at, and, and you've got a whole tally of different columns of different things. And um, But anyways, that's pretty interesting. Um, and with the rant, um, if a person goes to godsdestiny.org, um, you can actually look under resources, and you'll see the rant, and you'll get to see now. Um, and or in, de- in defense of a nation. Yeah. Okay. In defense yeah. of a nation, and it's got too. got a link there. Oh, good. To, okay. To my rant, because uh, I think it's very important. Of course, 
I, I try to put it up on my blog here too, so people can you know sure. get it. And of course, um, people want the rant; they just have to email you, and you'll put them an email right. list the, so that they get it the same day it's written, rather than sometimes three or four people goes through before they get it. Sure, and then you probably have quite a following now. Uh, pretty much, uh, I can, I know it's gone overseas because, of course, being in a military town, our we have readers in town here sure. whose spouses were overseas. They sent it over there. They share it. It's uh, it's quite it's quite comforting to know that at least my anger issue is getting out there for the whole world to see. <laughs> well, that's exciting, um, Michael. You know, there, there's just so many things that are happening that um, I don't even understand. And of course, we want to eventually, as we work through this, I want to talk about what's going to happen July 1st of 2014. But of course, we're going to lay that let let that kind of go for a little bit. Sure. Um, teaser for people because I think that's going to be some uh, big thing that people don't see coming yet. On number two here, you talk about the end of American based multinational overreach legislation. Do you want to go ahead and um, talk about that? This is a tough one. Uh, if you remember uh, recently, it was revealed that uh, Pfizer Corporation. Yeah, you were talking about this before we came on. Yeah, uh, Pfizer made a deal with a uh, German company that they would buy that that or excuse me a british company that they would buy the british company and just use their offices in uh, the united kingdom as the headquarters and basically leave the united states so that they could avoid it would be, it would be a, a foreign company now doing business mm-hmm. in america um it was stopped uh partly because of of fears our congress um and it's um uh, Carl Levin, a uh, Democrat out of uh, Michigan, mm-hmm. has uh, made a proposal with the backing and support of the Obama administration, mm-hmm. by the way, that in order to accomplish this kind of a deal, the American company is, uh, the American shareholders, the American owners of the company have to sell more than 50% to that foreign somebody, uh, a foreign entity, mm-hmm. in order to to accomplish the move. If they do not do that, then there is a retroactive clause in that uh, bill that is proposed where they can go back as far as they want against that particular company mm-hmm. and say, all of your income, you maybe you made the move in 1957, mm-hmm. all of your income, for the last 57 years has to be recalculated and retaxed at the higher rate because it's not a legal foreign entity. It is still an American company, mm-hmm. and the multinational flag does not matter. That's just scary because I don't think a lot of companies understand what's coming down. I don't. It's an erosion of liberty mm-hmm. because, again, you, you work, and this is what's killing the workplace. You, you work, you innovate. To make a small company big mm-hmm. or to even get a small company going, but then the, the goal is to grow so sure. that you're big. And all of a sudden, you've got the government coming in and saying, you can't do with it what's in your best interest or what you want to do. And that's that. Mm. You know, and that, that happens. You know, one of the worst places I see in an innovation that's stifled is just in government. <laughs> you know, that's overreach. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all the time. But one of the interesting things, uh, uh, Tim Geithner, mm-hmm. um, former uh, U.S. Uh, Treasury Secretary, who incidentally is a tax dodger. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know how he got appointed, but when Tim Geithner got in, he wrote uh, this, this book then uh, to expose some of the problems that he had run into. These weren't my problems. These were Washington's problems, more or less. Um, and in the book... He detailed how the Obama administration had worked on nationalizing our banks. Mm-hmm. Now, you have read the rant, and you know that I, almost a year ago, put the fact that the Cyprus uh, problem, the, the Cyprus bank holiday where they gave him a 30% haircut, originated at the U.S. Treasury Department. Mm-hmm. And in this, again, this is part of the, the thing, um, and this was the July 1st stuff that you're talking about. In the Dodd-Frank bill, in the, the language that was contained in the Consumer Protection Law, and in the FDIC regulations, mm-hmm. 
now money that you put into the bank doesn't belong to you. Mm -hmm. It belongs to that FDIC corporation, Mm -hmm. that institute. And the big word is corporation. Yes. And, And our problem is if they nationalize the bank, then it doesn't matter because they can call a bank holiday anytime they want. They can say, okay, um, for you people that tried to take money out of the bank to avoid this haircut, now all of a sudden we're going to issue new money, mm-hmm. new color, whatever, new shape, doesn't matter. But the old stuff is no longer valid. Mm-hmm. Well, if you held some back or had an extra 10000 or 20000 that you had taken out to, so you could avoid this haircut, now all of a sudden that is totally worthless. You can't use it at a store because the, the store shopkeeper is going to say, Oh, I'm sorry. You, I can't take this to the bank. I'm not taking this for for my goods. You got to give me the real stuff. Mm-hmm. So you've hurt yourself. So you're 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 kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't. It doesn't matter which way you go because of the regulations that was was written, because of the way that they uh, they go in and do committee changes mm-hmm. to the laws after they're written. And the regulations that don't follow the letter of the law, mm-hmm. now all of a sudden you have a congressman that can stand up before you and say, I didn't vote for it, or that language wasn't in the bill when I voted on it. Well, I'm sorry. If it's gone to committee and be am- yeah. to be amended, yeah. you know what? You should have to vote on it again before it can become law. True. Because what you voted on is no longer the law. Mm-hmm. You voted on something that was entirely different. And maybe they only changed one or two words, but the meaning changed. And boy, I'll tell you what, that really upsets me. Well, I think people are really going to be upset as we start seeing things happen as they currently are going now. The roller coaster now is at the pinnacle and now going down. Yes. And now we're starting to pick up speed. Um, Like I said before, you know, people are complaining at work that the pay raise wasn't nothing. Uh, like a kick in the jaw. Um, And everything is getting more expensive for them to live. Yeah, it doesn't keep up with the cost of inflation. Um, that's one more thing. You, do you love the way that they get, they figure inflation? Mm-hmm. Everybody knows it's a farce. They cut out housing. They cut out um, food. They cut out energy because those are too volatile. Yeah. You know what they cut out in this last, the first quarter of this year? What's that? Retail sales. That's right. Yeah. And, I mean, come on. If, if you've cut out housing, you've cut out food, you've cut out energy, and now you cut out retail sales, what are they actually putting in? The tickets on airlines? Uh, I, I don't know what's left in the, in the economy if you've cut that out. Well, you even mentioned about the dry Baltic, how did you call that now? The Baltic dry index. That's right, that's right. Yeah, explain that, because that was really interesting what you were kind of talking about before we came on here. Uh, Hang on five seconds. What the Baltic Dry Index is, it started out, of course, in the Baltic Sea. Mm -hmm. It was a way for them to keep track of what was being shipped Mm -hmm. and the value of the cargoes contained therein. And um, over time, of course, with technology, they were able to expand it to the whole world Mm -hmm. so they can keep track of everything. What caught my eye on that was the Baltic Dry Index had dropped – dramatically 53 percent in the time period of january 2nd of 2014 through may 12th of 2014 it had gone from a level of over 2110 down to 987 Mm -hmm. but when i got to reading it further to find out why this decline had taken place i found out that it had peaked back in November of 2009 at 4,507. Wow. So we're down to almost 20, we're just at 21% of what it was five years ago. Where is the recovering economy? Because again, this measures in, in dollars. Now, you and I both know that our government has been printing dollars like there's no tomorrow. Yes. So the value of each dollar that is being held has gone down in value. Mm-hmm. Pardon me, but the value of this has gone down. So how much, if, if you figure that our inflation has held that up 
20%. Now how much more has that dropped in, in correspondence? Uh, because they do value it in dollars. So it's really bad. But they have different ways, and they measure each ship to put it in a classification if it's over 100,000 tons, if it's, uh-huh. if it's less than, than, or over a million tons, if it's between uh, a million and 500,000, and all the way down to very small, uh, basically ferry-sized boats. And, the, what, and everything is measured and weighed and, and valued on how it go, moves um, from one port to another. But if international trade is down that much, now we've got a bigger problem that's being masked over on the surface. You know, um, this is stuff that I never even heard of. I mean, how, how does it? How does it? Can a person actually follow the dry Baltic rate? Can they, they? You can look it up on Google. Yes, you can. Okay. Yeah, it just, it's just one of those things where, like I say, you, you sit there and you look at it, and you wonder um, why. Uh, you complain about your 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 job pay that it's not um, not doing what you thought it was going to do and it's because of this situation where they are falsifying the shekel um, mm-hmm. and, and 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 making the Ephraim great and the shekels sure uh, you know and you know, they or they keep lowering the Ephraim and, and making the shekel greater and that's really not the thing. One of the things I, I like to do is go down to our state archives okay. and look at food ads mm-hmm. back in um, oh, 1962 mm-hmm. just to see what the sales were that week. And you didn't have near the amount of choice that mm-hmm. you have today. I, I'll, I'll give them that, particularly in winter. Mm-hmm. We didn't have, a, you know, it was all hothouse stuff. There was very grapes and stuff like that were gone, whereas now we get them from uh, Chile and whatever, Mexico, where they can grow pretty mm-hmm. much year-round. But the amount, not only has the amount that you paid per unit gone up, but they've changed the size of the units. Mm-hmm. It used to be an, a, a box of cereal, and I'll, I'll use something that's still around, Cheerios. Mm-hmm. I ran across an ad the other day, a 64-ounce box of Cheerios was a buck twenty nine. Mm-hmm. Okay, wait a minute. That was a sixty four ounce box of Cheerios. In today's paper, it was two dollars and eighteen cents, but it was a eighteen ounce box. Oh of Cheerios. Oh my gosh, that's really gone down at what four or five times from what? Yeah, yeah. almost almost of, of five times it's yeah. dropped compared, but the price is even a little higher than it was. Um, corn. And now I, I saw an ad today, corn, uh, six ears for $2. Mm-hmm. Corn, the same time of the year, and again, I know it's 50 years ago, but corn, a dozen for a dollar. A dozen, wow. A dozen ears for a dollar. Well, I think even last year you were getting six of them for a dollar. Yes, I mean, I mean, I don't know that special price will come up again, but the thing is, it's just increasing. Well, and it's it's it's, it's increasing exponentially. In other words, you're not going and adding it onto it; you are multiplying mm-hmm. onto it in such a way that it is incredible. And this goes back to the people that we talked about at the start that are on these fixed income type things that now they call an entitlement, mm-hmm. Social Security, or they're on a fixed income of some type. How are they going to do it? And they, I keep seeing articles that talks about how much food prices are going to increase. Well, we've already seen it. I've been tracking meat uh, and and uh, different items, uh, basic staples, since last January to now. So it's been 15, 16 months. Mm-hmm. I've been tracking it. And you could get a sale on milk where it was a buck nineteen. The best price I've seen in the last month to two months here has been a buck ninety nine. Most of the time, when it's on sale, it's two nineteen, two twenty nine, somewhere in that area, a gallon. Now they haven't changed it; it's still a gallon of mm-hmm. milk. But before, you're going to love this. What was the price of a gallon of milk in 1962? And I can remember when I was looking at this with my wife uh, because our mothers were complaining about it at the time because. Yeah. 
my mom, for instance, had two teenage boys, um, and we drank a lot of milk. But you know what the the top price, or the, excuse me, the sales price uh, was of milk back then? I'm going to say 15 cents. You're high. Oh, I'm high. Okay. You're high. You could you could get a gallon of milk for nine cents on sale. On sale. On sale. Whole milk. You know that's what someone was telling me. They said you know you could you could go down back in the seventies and and come out with like a couple shopping carts full of food for like forty bucks. Yes. I mean you really could. And now you go down there and you get you get a couple shopping carts full of maybe four hundred dollars. Well, why I started looking is it's one of those things. I was looking through one of my mom's old recipes. And it uh, it didn't it said to buy fifty cents worth of this item. Well, fifty cents worth of this item. <laughs> I mean, you're talking about a quarter sized deal. And so I began to look at it from that standpoint to find out how much prices have changed. What would have to be an equivalent amount today for fifty cents a pound? You could buy sirloin steak. Yeah. Now look at it. What is it? Nine ninety nine a pound. Yeah. For sirloin. Yeah. Um, if you buy a fancy cut of meat, it's up to thirteen. Look at what bacon is. Um, oh yeah. I mean, it's 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 ridiculous when you see how much things. Watermelon today. Add for watermelon mm-hmm. four dollars and eighty eight cents for a whole watermelon. Yeah. Back in nineteen sixty two. You could get the same water, maybe one a little bigger, 22-pounder, because they didn't have seedless variety. 25 cents 25 for a whole cents. watermelon. And, and those are the kind of things you say that you're not getting enough pay. Was your father or mother making as much money proportionately to pay for food back then as they were, as they are now? Okay, so, so wages have gone from... In the 60s, they were average of $350 a month. Now you're getting $3,500 a month is the average. Yeah. Or not quite that much because I think the average is 48000 So it's just half, about 4000 a month. Here's the problem. This stuff has gone up more than four times that amount. The watermelon has gone up almost 19 times well, I'm not making 19 times more than my folks were back then. You know, that's a good point because really their value of the money was worth so much more, even though it didn't seem like they were making that much money. We were tied to the gold standard, which uh-huh. is a phony standard, but it gave us some security, some backup security. But again, now we're not tied to anything. It's just how much is out there, how much is being printed, how much is, how much everybody has. One of the interesting articles I, I saw this week was uh, David... Um, excuse me. I'm trying to think of the guy's name, David Witz. He was a David Owitz, uh, and I've lost his first name. I think it's Harry. Okay. Herman David Witz. Anyway, he's an economist, and he said the downturn this winter in the economy, where they're talking about retail sales falling in January, February, and March, was not because of the bitter weather or the unseasonable weather that we were having, even for winter. But it's because Americans simply don't have money. Mm -hmm. Well, again, when you have to put the roof over your head, when you have to pay for food, what's left for the want to have things like a chair? Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, I can sit on the floor. I can get by sitting on the floor. I don't need a bed. I just need a mattress on the floor. So there's nice to have, and then there's need to have things. Mm Mm-hmm. Today, I look at it in the kids under 25, for instance, I think one of the need to have things is communication. Mm -hmm. They got to have, they got to be connected with their friends. Well, if the power goes down, and and this is one of the funny things, you know, you're talking to people that are are in the preparedness business and they say, here, you need this shortwave radio so you can stay connected. Sure. Hear what's going on. How are are you going to get the power, both for the transmitter and the receiver? Oh, well, this is battery operated. Great, but what are you going to hear? Because it's going to be dead air. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, it's one of those things where you kind of have to laugh at it because they're saying, okay, there's going to come a problem. We're going to have a disaster. You need to get prepared for it. You need to have food, mm-hmm. water, this kind of stuff stocked up. But you need a radio? I don't think so. But today's kids, 
uh, today's young people can't live without being connected. Mm -hmm. And when that goes down or if that goes away, look at the disaster that happened when they had the, the flood mm -hmm. here in, in northern Colorado this, yeah. this in September. And the problems that were called because the phone lines were down, the, the cell towers were down. I mean, things disappeared that people were used to having. It was great. Well, the power was still, the battery was still good in their phone somewhat. But as soon as that power died or they could no longer get power up to the, to the transmit of the relay station, they, they panicked. Yeah. Well, and this is something I'll throw out. And I know you probably know about this, but I'm going to go ahead and then I'll let you go with it too. Um, Obama, starting in 2015, January 1st of next year, which will be here in six months or so, seven months, has mandated that so many coal plants are going to be go offline because they don't meet EPA standards. Yeah. And then that being said, this last winter, I was listening to Glenn Beck. He said that we were one power plant from going offline because we were using so much power. We haven't been able to add new power plants. True. Um, and, and what, what Glenn Beck was saying is that if a, certain spot because it's all one massive grid now there's overlapping sections and stuff and they trade power back and forth but this was in response to the uh, power plant attack out at los angeles sure where it was hit 30 37 of their individual transformers were taken out mm -hmm. with a gun that was a test but the thing is if they take out stations there and one in illinois is there any there's, there's no guarantee, I should say, that the system will stay up. Mm -hmm. We'll have a rolling brownout mm -hmm. as it tries to adjust. A brownout that could turn into a blackout if it's in the wrong time, when you're having an especially cold oh, yeah. spot where the heat is being used, or if it's an especially hot spot where the air conditioners are being used. Sure. It could knock out all the stuff, and then there'll be enough of a drain and enough of a lag that they can't get it restarted. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and then also add um, add on to that even more so is now all our natural gas is pumped out of the ground by electric pu right. pumps. Now they're all made in. Oh, I'm sorry, no, they're man They're all by natural gas pumps. Yes, but they're now man mandating that all will be pumped out because by electric. They can't, yeah, because it, it's going to be cheap. But here was the thing: Europe tried to go this route, Spain in particular, and they found out an interesting little thing. You put more than 10% of your power grid mm -hmm. into alternatives, the solar powered or the, um, what was the other one that, well, the wind power. Oh, yeah. Um, you put that into alternative energies that aren't consistent, not, aren't there all the time. The system collapsed on itself. Mm -hmm. So they mandated that you can only have 7% maximum of the alternative power. How is the U.S. combating that? They're taking those lithium-ion batteries that they couldn't sell in the Volt car mm -hmm. or in the on these electric cars that were, and they're they're plugging those in. And what they do is they charge up, mm -hmm. and the deal is that they're supposed to hold that charge until a time of need, and then they can reverse that and send it into the system. Oh. But again, that's short term. Remember, those things were only good to to run a car. For 50 miles. Mm -hmm. How long is that going to run a, a city? How long is that going to run a household? Well, and that's what somebody made a point with all the wind turbines. They said, just to power Long Island, you would need enough wind turbines the size of Vermont. It's not effective. Here's the ironic part about your, your wind turbines. They are doing more harm to the environment mm -hmm. by killing the birds yep. than they are than you're getting power out of them. You got to think about this now. As, again, as a as a person that likes mathematics, each one of those veins is a hundred and ten feet long. Yes. Okay. You go out there and watch them here south of town or whatever. When the wind's blowing, they're making that turn, that full circle, about every second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hundred and ten foot radius. Square that. You got to find out how big of they are. So, that they're that it's going through how much space that's covering and that thing is moving in excess of 600 feet per second mm -hmm. almost 700 feet per second birds are not equipped to dodge that they don't have the senses the sensory perceptions 
to avoid those things, go and look at the at the masses of birds that are lying down underneath these things, killed. And they're supposed to help the environment. Yeah, yeah we're getting rid of smog. But here's the dirty little secret there. They keep talking about carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. You go back and look at the real data that came off of the ice cores in the Antarctic that they mm -hmm. took and in the uh, from Greenland. The heat went up. The Earth's temperature went up before the carbon dioxide went up. Not the other way around. If carbon dioxide was the cause then the, it would have preceded, the rise there would have preceded the heat. It's not. It's the other way around. Well, it's with, um, you know, trees and that. They all live on it, and they're all trying to, to get away with it. As a matter of fact, the company they worked for, um, we were providing CO2 for um, the plants down in Fort Collins for the marijuana growers. Sure. Yeah, you know, I mean. Ah, make them bigger and lush. That's right. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know how they can say, that, you know, carbon dioxide is so bad because the plant we know takes it and makes oxygen for it us. It traps heat. Mm -hmm. And we can't, we don't emit as much energy. Well, the problem is, as you know, the Earth's core is magma. Uh-huh. And it has no way of releasing that. Right now we have, except by explosion, right now we have 42 active volcanoes along the Pacific Rim area that they talk about. 42 active volcanoes that where the Earth is trying to rid itself of this heat. But the biggest problem you have is, again, that sends up this nitrous carbon dioxide. Sure. And it traps even more than energy heat from the sun. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. We can't get rid of it. But you're not going to change things atmospheric-wise unless you apply the same standards that our EPA is applying on us to the rest of the world so that economically they don't have a trade advantage. Yeah. Well, that being said, <laughs> Michael, we could keep going. Sure. Um, figuring job unemployment, uh, governments change standards to obtain growth. Yes, you know, one of the things that you had mentioned is that you actually pull all the stats from all the counties. You don't just look at the overview. You get each county's County stats. by county, yeah. So I can go back uh, a couple of dozen years and compare what a county has done is doing now compared to what it was doing at its peak in 2006 or uh, a good time was back in 1997. Yeah. So um, with, with, with figuring job unemployment, you know, what is government doing there? Okay. They're changing the base. Mm -hmm. um, they count a job as a job as a job as a job. And as you just said uh, earlier, as you're talking about your pay hasn't kept up with it, but you've got a full-time job. Mm -hmm. So many people have are, cannot find a full-time job, and because of Obamacare, they're not creating full-time jobs. 75% of all the jobs that have been created in the last four years during the recovery are part-time jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, a part-time job is not a living wage job, It's as Bill Clinton put it. They're not a livable, you can't sustain a family on a part-time job. So you can on a full-time job in most cases. So what they're doing is they're comparing apples and oranges when they say we're back to 145 million jobs in this country. Well, first of all, they peaked at 153 million back in 2006. Mm -hmm. So we've lost... 8 million jobs still. We're still behind 8 million. But in that time, our population has grown almost 2.5 million people per year. Mm -hmm. Okay, explain to me how we're keeping up with it. The, and this is why the participation rate, even as they figure it, has dropped so much. But so many people are on disability. So many people have been, that they, they put them on disability, 11 million, that they put people in places where they didn't belong to get on a government program. That's why you have to have housing. That's why you have to have food, assistance, aid to families with children, all this stuff, just so those families can continue to survive even at a poverty level. Mm -hmm. But it's not growth. It's not growth. They're measuring a dollar, a valueless dollar today against a dollar that had a little bit more value five years ago. Or they're measuring a part-time job and temporary job the same as a full-time job was before. 
Yeah. And it's not. It's, it's apples and oranges. And until they break that and say, okay, this is our workforce participation rate. This is how much we've got going now compared to the same figure 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 mm-hmm. years ago, and, popu- and compare that to an equal population so that you know per capita you're keeping up with it. We're not. Per capita, we're falling farther and farther and farther behind, and the, the pace of that is picking up. It's like a runner in a relay race. The other guys are counting things, and they keep passing off the baton. Well, I had a shorthanded team. I have one guy running the whole race. Yeah. So he doesn't have to slow down to pass it off, but by the same token, he's losing ground because he can't run as fast the second leg as he ran the first one. He can't run the third leg as fast as he ran the first one. And it, it just keeps slowing down until he gets he's out of the race. Hmm. And that's why economically, part of the reason we can't compete with the rest of the world. Why is it that Cheyenne seems like it kind of does well compared to other places I've seen? Okay. First of all, uh, statistic-wise, we have massive amount of government here. Mm-hmm. We have federal government installation. We have the state government headquarters. We have the county seat mm-hmm. and the municipal seat. So when you put all those things together with our population, um, and this is weird because um, you asked that question, but yeah. again, back when I was in high school, I interned one year with uh, uh, Tino Roncalio, who was our U.S. representative at the time. And he wanted to do a study of everybody in Wyoming and to find out who was getting some kind of government aid and why they were getting it. And what he was hoping for was that we would find 40 to 50, 60 percent of these people were there because of circumstances beyond their control. Mm -hmm. Instead, uh, and the the study was led by a guy named uh, Julian Sandoval. Instead, what was found was 92. 2%, 2%, and this, I mean, we're talking 50 years ago, wow. 92% of the people that were receiving some kind of welfare aid were there because they wanted to be. They didn't want to take any responsibility to have a job. They didn't want to take it. They were in those circumstances because they wanted to be. Mm-hmm. Now, were they there because of a catastrophic uh, illness? There were some people that were that way. They were there because they had had a catastrophic disaster in the home, uh, earthquake or whatever. Most of them were there because they were just too doggone lazy. And it was so much simpler to take. Mm-hmm. Well, that same thing that I did back then translated forward now. And there, it's it, that's why the situation is getting so dire is because so many people are in that mold. Well, as long as somebody will provide it, why should I work? I can live with mommy and daddy and still be taking something from the government. Sure. Um, I know so many people that now it's like, well, I'll lose my job. I'll just go into employment for a while. I'll do this. I'll yeah. do that. But how long is that going to last? Be, be everybody going on that. And, and one, of the, one of the problems, is, is, again, is regulation. We need regulation to attack regulation. Mm-hmm. And get away from this nanny state that we've gotten ourselves into. The only, the only thing that can get us back is for the government to back out of interference with the market. Let it drop. Mm -hmm. If it drops to 22, let it drop and find a level that the current economy can sustain it at. Mm Mm-hmm. And then let corporate America go back to work without this massive amount of red tape. And yes, I lived in Pittsburgh for a while when I was younger. I had family back there. And in the summer, it was gray, murky. You couldn't see you couldn't see a shadow of high noon. Oh, really? Okay. Because of the smog that was trapped in there. Yeah. But you know what? People really didn't care because they had money to spend. They were working in the steel mills. They were working. It wasn't a rust belt. It was a thriving, booming entity. Mm -hmm. And yes, there was pollution. I understand that. They clean up the water, try to maintain some semblance of, of clean air. Because my grandfather was a smoker back there. 
Mm-hmm. His lungs never got a break. He was breathing it in yeah. because he was outside working, and he was also a smoker. So he never, his lungs never got a break. He died from lung cancer. Mm-hmm. But the thing was, people were able to thrive. They had the feeling that they were succeeding, yeah. and that's not something we have now. True. I mean, and you know, I know that. Um, I know people at work that have a full time job are looking for, you know, part time work just so they can make it. Um, and even at that point, they're still not making Making. it. And this, this is, this brings me to another article. I'm glad you said that because I just brought it up. Um, we have a a credit problem in this country Mm -hmm. and at the, at the government level, all levels of government down to the individuals, we have a credit problem. We are living beyond our means Mm -hmm. and this credit implosion Several prominent uh, economists at, uh, at the Heritage Foundation put compiled a paper and and showed that, that the coming credit implosion will make the recession of 07, 09 look like child's play, hmm. is how they worded it. Um, that what's coming up is going to be so big, so massive, and so devastating to our economy. Because just think, if you can't go to the store... And, and shop with credit. You can't fill up your car on credit. You can't go out and have a nice dinner on credit. You have to have the cash in hand. Mm-hmm. Very few of us have the cash in hand to do that. That's true. I mean, um, yeah, there's people that are making it from barely from paycheck to paycheck. Right. And, um, and those who have something, you kind of wonder how they're doing it. Well, and even then, this is why you look at, at Walmart, you look at some of these discount stores, Target, Target uh, sales, quote unquote, went up this this month. If you count units sold, but they made such deep discounts that in reality their earnings report fell. Oh, okay. So it's it's a it's a double edged sword. Yes, we moved more product, but your profits were gone. It and it's a real toss up if places like Target, if places like J.C. Penney's are even going to survive for another year. I've been hearing that with, with uh, Sears. Sears is the same shape, and Kmart, because they're tied together. And if you go to Kmart, I mean, it's a ghost town there, really. For the most part, yeah. yeah you can, I like shopping there better because yeah. I don't have to fight the crowds. I can park close to the door, sure. short hike in, get get my stuff, and then get back out. And they actually have Craftsman tools there. <laughs> yeah, then they have some stuff that's valuable. But it's, it, like I say, it's if, if it was one area, I would say that we could fix it. Mm-hmm. But the problems are so massive, they're so diversified, and they come from so many different quarters that really and truly, without a national resetting of standards, a national resetting of, of value to our monetary system that we can live with, we're not going to survive. I think a reset's really going to come, but I think it's not in the way that people are going to like it. Yeah, it's going to be a reset. And again, um, I'll take our banking situation. How are they going to impose that when so many of our banks are really owned by overseas uh, companies? Mm-hmm. And I, you know, you've, you've, you've got the the British, uh, or the Scottish National Bank, Scottish Royal Bank, whatever they call it, over here. You have Parabus out of France that really owns uh, Bank of the West. You have the Chinese that are buying up. In fact, they're, they're even looking at acquiring completely um, J.P. Morgan Chase. And I think they're even trying to take over the Federal Reserve. Term, well, they? through that, yeah. by that, um, because it's, it's a large part of what the, the Reserve does. And they own so much of our debt. If they consolidated that with a major bank holding in the United States, they would have enough pull enough power that they would be able to s- step in and actually run our federal reserve when, when, when does it get to that point when they run everything and they come to your house and say okay pay up or get out well again oh, we've talked about this but in the bible you know, it says that they are going to come mm-hmm. to the house of israel they're going to come to yeah. for goods that they that they can't do themselves um they can't grow food like we can. They don't have the bread basket like we have. And they have four times the people to feed. Mm-hmm. And so, again, we're in a situation that we still are the shining light, 
But unfortunately, it's because everybody's laser gun is aimed at us and and we are the target for the rest of the world because they don't have even as bad as things are getting here right now we have vast wealth compared to what the average person in the world has and before i forget i will put links in the bottom of this youtube video for the house of israel if people don't understand which i know that's still the people may not understand um that's one thing that really got me to really wake up to what was going on in our country and that we actually are in the Bible. And, um, Michael, you know, it shocked me when I read um, Stan's book, In Defense of a Nation, Stanley Grant's. That and, was Steve that wrote In Defense of a Nation. Or was no, it? No, it was Steve. Well, Stephen. Yeah, Steve wrote Bible, America and the Bible. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah. what it was. Yeah. And America and the Bible showed that. And then in, and then In Defense of a Nation showed what we're, what's coming to, yeah. the, to us. Through it. But, boy, wasn't that interesting. And I did oh, yeah. the same thing. I, I sat there and I'm going... All the stuff I thought at Christmas, and that's why I tell him all the time that he ruined my Christmas, yeah. is because I had to rethink. When they said Israel, O come, O come, Emmanuel, ransom captive Israel, I was thinking that this meant the Jews. Mm-hmm. Well, they're just in a country named Israel. It has nothing to do with the house of Israel. True. And that the only place in the world where the 13 tribes of Israel are connected together and living in harmony is in the United States of America. Mm-hmm. And that is, that's spooky when you put all that together. Well, and I think what's interesting about the house of Israel is that, um, people are so accustomed that when you read the old Testament, when you see Israel, you just read Israel and you throw everything together. But when you understand, I believe it's first or second Kings, I can't remember, but it was a war with Jerry Bowl. It might've been the first Kings 12. Yeah. Where they had the separation of all the tribes, and, that, yes. the, and they had the house of Israel and the house of um, Judah. Judah. And of, of course, if a person goes through all of Genesis and understands the lineage for Abraham, um, Isaac, and Jacob, and understands the sons, the crossing yeah, of, the, the, of the blessing, yeah, and and the, and the denouncement of Reuben, which really and truly is Putin. Well, you know, and I think what was interesting when Stan brought up about, um, you know, you look at the Scottish. And yes. how many of the Scottish have, like, Hebrew-like sounding names? Yes. And also, back when they did their um, Declaration of Independence, like in 1280 or something something like that, back way back when, that actually has um, the cornerstone on there saying um, um, the outgoings of the House of Israel. They start wondering, well, wait a second here. There are some major things going on here. Yeah, and it, it, when they connected some dots, mm-hmm. boy, then I had to reread everything and, and find out. But the, 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 the question to start that got this off the sure. rabbit trail was unemployment. Mm-hmm. And the unemployment rate is at its lowest level that it's been in five and a half years. It's 6.3. Yeah. That figure is as phony as a $3 bill. It just doesn't fit because there's so many people that they've taken out of the workforce and even taken people out of the workforce. This accounts for our increase in population mm-hmm. and a lower workforce participation rate than we've had since 1978 sure that's how they got down there and can say that there's more jobs there's not more jobs i can just i mean all you have to do is go to uh, bls.gov and look at those old reports because that's the bureau of labor statistics and it shows you you can go back in their historical part and find out what they topped out at 153 million jobs we're down 145 million jobs. Jobs ain't there. Mm-hmm. And then if they take out the full-time, or excuse me, the part-time jobs, do you get down to the those full-time jobs? And not everybody wants a full-time job. I'm not saying that. But the number of full-time jobs have shrunk dramatically. Mm-hmm. So even the jobs that are coming back aren't equal to the jobs that went away. And I'm coming across more and more people that are actually have two or three jobs. They're just going from here to there to here to there. All the time. And, and then again, then you have to put in the fact that your wage, your your real wage, between 2001 and now, is basically stagnant. True. And yet prices on everything have continued to rise. That is true. Well, let's go on to part number four that you got in here. Um, linking the VA and Obamacare with government overreach. Yes. And again, that comes in the form of the death panels. Mm-hmm. Um in, in Obamacare, the cost is just 
so massive that they're not going to be able. They keep saying it's one sixth of the economy. If you look at the stuff without Obamacare uh, mandate for these web care and these other different things, these other programs that are tied into that, our economy would have shrunk completely off of. But they're counting that increase as part of the economy. And it's really not. It's just another, because we still, as taxpayers, we still have to pay for that. And it's not doing us as much good. So when you break that down and start looking at it, the only way, and and of course this is in Obamacare, anyone under seven years of age is not entitled to health care on its terms, straight out. They're not put at the front of the line because they are not yet contributing to society. Mm -hmm. Anybody over the age of 42, you are declining in value to society because your best years are behind you. Well, there goes the old people. Who is it that they're the, they were letting die in the VAs? The older people. The older people yeah. because it's the old vets. The guys that had problems. Well, if I take you, if I see you, now I got a problem because it's going to cost us money. So what I'll do is I'll put this aside. And it's government corruption. It's government, and yet these people got paid bonuses for meeting those lower goals. Oh, yeah, $8,000, I think, that's one bonus. Yeah, well, and again, it's uh, it, it's just, and this is coming on Obamacare. And again, Sarah Palin got ridiculed when she called them death panels. They're not doctors. They are accountants and economists that are in charge of these boards by Obamacare standards, not the doctors. Well, I'm sorry. I'm a bean counter. Mm -hmm. And boy, I tell you, when you get down to the end of the line, you watch what you make sure. And okay, so you're at the back of the line. I'm sorry, but my neighbor, I love my neighbor. I like him a lot. He's got a very nice wife. But my wife is older than her. Mm -hmm. If they come down with the same problem, she's going to go in line ahead of my wife. She better be watching her back because I'm going to do whatever I can to get my wife taken care of. True. I'm not going to sit here and let her die. Mm-hmm. You know, the thing with the VA, what kind of gets me is it's the same thing that happened with the Bundy Ranch, with the same thing that happened with Benghazi, with the same thing that happened with Fast and Furious and everything else. <laughs> it's reported on. People get a little mad about it and then all of a sudden they go on to something else. They go to the next highlight of the day. Yeah. I got a prime example. When was the last time you heard anything about the Malaysian flight? It's probably been three weeks a month. Okay. It's two weeks old. Or excuse me, two months old. Uh huh. It's dropped off of the face. Why? Because they can't find anything. I'm sorry, if that plane went into the water, knowing how planes are designed it's going to go in with some force. Those wings, the tail parts are going to snap off. They would have found some kind of debris. Mm-hmm. There would have been shattered windows. There would have been something. A fuselage would have, would have ripped apart a little bit. There would have been some debris that you would have been able to find. They have found nothing. Well, that plane had to be at stall speed when it hit. I'm sorry. That just doesn't compute because mm-hmm. it's going to be coming down. What did they say? It was at 35,000 feet? Yeah, or something like that, yeah. And, okay, even if it was at 5,000, it's dropping because there's a lot of dead weight there. Oh, sure. And 122 feet per second, that's going with some force. That's moving, yeah. Yeah, so you, you have to look at it. But the VA and some of the problems, I'm not blaming the current administration for the problems in the VA center. Those problems have been around for eons. Mm-hmm. But it's an indicator of what is coming in Obamacare. You promise one thing, then you find out what the cost of that really is, and people are shoved under the table for the sake of expediency because we can't afford it. Well, and the thing is, I don't think American people realize that the stuff that's happened in the military, the stuff that's happened at the VA, this is what's coming for a whole, for all the people in the United States. Yes. The Hoover Institute uh, looked at that real close. Mm -hmm. uh, Just... uh, a oh, couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago, um, first part of May. And what they did is they said, 
that the Obamacare system has created a two-tiered medical system or health care system in the United States. And it was designed to. Mm-hmm. I, despite what the authors say, it was designed to. Those that have the, the means, the financial means of obtaining their own uh, services can pay for it. Those people will get better health care than the rest, mm-hmm. period. Well, what's different? You got that now anyway. Same thing when you go into court. It's not equal justice because O.J. Simpson can afford a great lawyer team. Yeah. Mike McCune can't. Mike McCune gets convicted. O.J. does it. Mm-hmm. And yet there was more than enough circumstantial evidence. Did the cops try to plant and bolster the, the evidence? Sure. Mark Furman did. He planted a glove. Was the guy guilty? Yeah. But beyond a shadow of a doubt, and, and I ch- here's the jump, but they went in. All their testimony was they went on to O.J.'s property because they saw a trail of blood. Mm-hmm. Their weapons were holstered, so they really didn't fear that there was going to be the perp on the premises, number one. Number two, they followed a blood trail, and yet they never called for emergency aid. One part of that story or the other has to be false. Mm-hmm. It can't go. And so their reasoning for going in, number one, was was phony. Reason number two is they sat there, even with the lead attorneys, prosecuting attorneys, and drank iced tea on his back porch for four hours before the warrant from the court arrived. Really? To search premises. Give me a break. If I'd have been sitting on the jury, I would have had to find him not guilty just on that basis. And this one, and I've taken Republican uh, congressional people and I'll use Cory Gardner's name as a prime example, he voted for it. Mm -hmm. He voted for Obamacare. Well, that language is not there. I read him the quote. I quoted out of the legislation, and he says, well, it's not there when I voted on it. They had to do that in the committee, the Senate House Committee, after the fact. Well, if that was the case, then you should have had to re-vote on it. It shouldn't have become law because you made adjustments to it before it took effect. Mm Mm-hmm. And you can't do that. To put a regulation in by by the administration, since they gave it to Health and Human Services, that was fine. But not change the wording of the law so that these become onerous burdens for the American people. But we have to pass it to find out what's in it. Well, again, that was the prime example. Um, it just it blows everything out the, out the tooth. But again, this is why veterans were pushed aside. Mm-hmm. is because they made promises and didn't foresee the size of the promise when they made it. Mm-hmm. And and I know we've covered quite a bit of, of material and jumped all over the place. But once again, if you make a promise, you are obligated to keep it. Mm-hmm. Not to the best of your ability. You are obligated to keep that word of the promise that you made. Mm-hmm. These young men and women or these older veterans, which were mostly men, signed up with this promise given to them. Mm -hmm. And then the government backs down because of financial concern. Well, you know what? I got a financial concern. Quit stealing from me on the 15th of April every year. Quit stealing from me every time I get a paycheck. That's ridiculous. I'll tell you what. Let me give you what I want to give you. And, again, they're not going to operate that way. But it's interesting that way back when they found that the tax laws were constitutional with two provisions. Mm -hmm. The first, that the common use of the language that is used in the law is used in enforcing the law. That the you can't read intent into the law. Well, we wanted to cover this. Well, if you didn't say so, too bad, so sad. That was number one. Number two was it had to be applied equitably to everybody, mm-hmm. equally. And so here's the point. How can you have different tax rates for different brackets? Mm-hmm. You can't do that legally. But that was the whole premise of the progressive income tax. 
So, I mean, I'm sorry. Give me a break. It doesn't work. And it, it, whether you're you're trying to do oil and gas, um, and, and there's a prime example. We're looking at this, our, our royalties and the severance taxes that are coming up. And here again, Ken Salazar, when he was the Department of the uh, Interior Secretary, he was upset because his department, the BLM, had given out hundreds of thousands of leases Mm -hmm. for exploration. Why aren't you people doing anything about this? You got the lease. Uh, They didn't have the permit. That comes from the EPA, and it's not (laughs) about to come. Yeah. I mean, so they're talking, the government was talking out of both sides of its mouth at the same time. Yeah, this agency gave me something. This agency won't let me use that something. Okay, now what do you do? Yeah, and that was true because um, where I work at, um, we had to deal with a, with a with a problem with uh, helium. Um, yes, the BLM wouldn't let them get drill new wells or whatever it was to get the helium out of the ground. Well, a government agency that makes gun turrets needs this helium argon mix. Mm-hmm. They're like, well, we need this. Well, you guys over here, government said you can't do this, so you guys are actually strangling yourself. You have to, uh, and again, this came from NASA originally because mm-hmm. they used helium uh, to help lift, make the rockets as light as possible, and they put in a, that you had to recover all the helium that was produced by any well or mine. Sure. And boy, I tell you that that that's. Uh, I think I wrote in a report one time that that's a pretty little problem. <laughs> yeah. When I was requested to analyze what they could do with this, and it's it it causes a problem because if you go on one side, you're following this agency's rules and regulations, but by doing so, you're in violating violation of this agency's rules and regulations. They shouldn't have overlapping power, or if well, they just shouldn't have overlapping power. Period. Um. There's a gentleman I want to have on here in the future. He's running for sheriff, and um, he's been looking really at, close at the IRS and the ATF. <laughs> and he was saying that the IRS is actually taking um, code law out of ATF and putting it into IRS. He yes. Says, you can't do that. You're not supposed yeah. to be able to do that. And, that should, that's a violation, yes. Yeah, and, and, and what they're trying to do is they're basically trying to take people's homes away from them through ATF I don't know. I'd have to relook at it again. But um, he was saying that, you know, this certain law, you have to stay within this aspect of law, but they're actually overlapping and they're illegal by doing those things. Uh, I, I agree. And mm-hmm. the problem is um, each agency has specific laws that they were supposed to uh, then put the regulations, the rules and regulations out for. Mm-hmm. Well, for you to adopt another agency's rules and regulations is usurping their authority Mm -hmm. a great deal or expanding them beyond the bounds that they are limited. This is why FEMA is buying rifles and Mm -hmm. ammunition. Uh, It's ridiculous. But one of the the problems um, that you and I have have talked about is, is there real growth? Mm -hmm. Is there real growth? One of the one of the stories that uh, I, I picked up on was that factory growth around the globe is faltering, not just in the United States, but around the globe. It's not consistent. They'll have a surge and then there's a pullback, and it's it's actually at lower levels than it's been in two years mm-hmm. around the world because they can't move the product. Again, yeah, there are sales. But it's only there. Yeah. But the number yeah. of units that are being sold are fewer and fewer and fewer. I seen a thing over in Europe. They have this huge car lot, and they can't sell these cars. Yes, they just can't sell them. The units are made. The units are out, and they're in inventory. They're counted as pr- production, but they can't move them because people can't afford them. They're too busy buying food and medicine and heat to stay warm and. And uh, housing, I'm sorry, they won't let you live in a cave. You've got to have certain standards, and then the house that you live in has to meet the building code so it doesn't burn down and endanger somebody. Hmm. It's it's a mess. We've got too much regulation. Well, I'm talking about regulation um, here in Cheyenne. You know, you can't 
do anything in this town anymore without having some kind of permit. And, you know, and now you go back to like in Arkansas, we would visit out there and my gosh, if you want to drill well, you don't need a permit. Okay. Well, tomorrow morning we'll be here and we'll start drilling. Yes. You know, we need more of that. That's what would help unstifle things. Well, but again, it, and it, like I say, you got to get government out of the business of regulation. They cannot regulate the market. They would like to, they're trying to, but they shouldn't be allowed to if we're to retain any liberties whatsoever. You have to turn around and put that in a situation where they're out of the market, that they should have no interest in the market. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the original standards. Uh, it wasn't supposed to be a full-time job. You had, as a citizen servant, a civil servant, you had to divest yourself of your holdings. Mm -hmm put them in a trust or something where your actions could not affect the profit or loss of that, oh. of that holding mm -hmm. today. They made full-time careers out of it mm -hmm. and it was supposed to rotate so that you didn't have the same people there over and over and over and over. But the two party system became the norm and now they're growing closer and closer together. They're not there for us as citizens. They are there for themselves yeah, to, the to in, expand their power and their control. And they have to show that they spent all this money so that they can go back. And only in Washington does a cut still give you an increase in budget one year to the next. Mm. Sounds like a corporation to me. Yeah, it does. Um, um, but again, I've, I've got a couple of things sure. that we want to talk about. Uh Food and fuel prices are soaring. Uh, mm -hmm. Economists across the globe are foreseeing a major, major uh, problem come August, September in, in, in those prices. They're, they're seeing a massive spike coming towards us. Well, now this is good for the economy because, remember, we talk about dollars trading hands. Sure. But the problem is if everything is going into food and fuel just to survive, where does the housing aspect, where does that extra pair of pants mm -hmm. or that new pair of pants or worn out shoes, how does that come about? It's going to be worse than it was in the 30s uh, when this thing finally implodes on itself. It, the house of cards and the wind is blowing. All somebody has to do is open a window a crack wow. and it'll collapse. So we really, really see food riots in that this fall. That's where Hunger Games came from. Yeah. was uh, one of those what-if scenarios that they work on to try and prevent an emergency from happening. And you see that movie then? Yes. What did you think of it? It's believable in the fact that, again, if food prices do take the spike that they're into, hit the top range of the spike they're looking at, there will be a lot of people hunting for food. You guys are out here in the country. Oops, guess what? you're going to have to defend yourself because they're going to be coming mm -hmm. for what you've got. And it may not be entirely Americans. It could be Chinese. It could be Russians. It could be whoever. Um, because the rest of the world is already facing these problems. England yeah. uh, reneged on its debt and basically has been, they still maintain the aura of being a, sec, uh, a, a top flight economy, but they're really second rate. They've been struggling mm -hmm. with that ever since. You know, and I, from what I hear a lot is, you know, how many Russian and Chinese are here now? We've let them in, and we, we continue to let them in. Uh, they don't have to come in illegally. Just get asylum request mm -hmm. or uh, Somalia. I'll say, well, I've got Somalia. It's easy to make a thing to show. I lived in Somalia. Here you are. Well, here's a question to ask you, Michael. Um, I've heard a lot of Russians now have actually become truckers. What doesn't, exactly. yeah, what doesn't stop them from stopping the economy? Uh, actually, there is a trucking firm that is out of Sacramento mm -hmm. called MJ Trucking. Okay. And uh, it was entirely run by Russians. It was the Russian mafia. And, mm -hmm. and uh, the only reason they came to the notice was the fact that they were averaging a wreck every 13 miles. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. It was brutal. I mean, it was it was incredible. They had no safety record because the people couldn't read English. They couldn't communicate in any way, shape, or form with what was normal. They could be listening to the radio and not understand, oh, there's a tornado coming down or there's ice ahead or 
you know, they couldn't read the warning signs. They mm-hmm. didn't know what was going on. And, and their trucking record was very, but the attorneys that they had were based out of Sacramento and they even had a Russian on the staff, uh, a foreign born Russian. And they were the mouthpieces and they kept fighting and fighting and fighting for these guys. And they actually, uh, got them out of a lot of, uh, problems and, and enabled this trucking firm to continue to uh, exist. Even to this day. Even to this day. Amazing. And you can't find, they, they change where they're filing from. Their headquarters are in Springfield, Illinois, one, one year. And the next year they're in, uh, uh, they're coming out of Sacramento, California, or they're coming out of Phoenix, or they're coming out of uh, Batesville, Indiana, or someplace. I mean, they're, they're never in the same place twice. So when you're passing a truck, you may be passing somebody that might be a Russian then. Yeah, and, then, and they're dangerous drivers because, again, they, have, they really don't know how to handle a truck that size. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting. It just seems like our country is ripe for picking. But, again, if, if we're going to have CDL licenses, then everybody should adhere to the same standard. And if you, if you know very well, the Mexican drivers that yeah. come up across the border, they're a danger because they don't have to pass the same test. They don't have to be as qualified as our drivers. So, okay, I'm sorry. You're in your 2012 uh, Explorer. This guy's behind you on the road. Who's going to win? The guy, other guy. Yeah, with that 80-ton 80, 80 truck. Yeah. You don't stand much of a chance. Yeah, I hear all our truckers we have, you know, they're stringent, you know, always oh, coming sure. more and more. But they're American-based. Yeah. You're an American-based company. You're not somebody that's coming in here from outside and has same thing. Look at the look at the safety record of our ferry system mm-hmm. that goes to the various islands on the coast. Look at the safety record, you know, of like in Indonesia. Well, it doesn't matter. They've got too many people. They've got more people than they know what to do with. So they don't need to have safety measures that are that great mm-hmm. uh, or that stringent. And it takes somebody to really say, oh, wait a minute. That cockpit crew, why are we blocking them in so that nobody can get in there at them? Because what if the cockpit crew is the problem? And that may be on flight 370. That's true. You know, um, I guess I want to kind of maybe touch on a little bit more on um, with our banking. <laughs> and um, only because... When we kind of talked beforehand about uh, gold and silver, you know, if you divest your holdings into gold and silver, sure. they know because they're reporting over $600. Yes. So what does a person do? Do they, in, you know, divest into like property? Um, well, again, any transaction yeah. is as, that's more than a set amount mm-hmm. has to be reported so that uh, you can't get away with it. That was their way of tracking it. Basically, they're trying to take your private property away. They're trying to take property away, yes. They're they're trying to make sure that what you are selling, and this is how it was, was proposed, is not stolen goods, mm-hmm. that you're unwittingly, somebody's buying stolen goods and therefore can be charged with a crime, mm-hmm. uh, or that it's not, that it's legal property and it's going for the right price. What do you see? Today is May right now, May 21st. What do you see in six months? What do you? How do you see our country? See, and that, and that's we're go, we're going to continue to slide. I'm not saying that all this is going to hit in the next six months, mm-hmm. but you're going to see more and more anger. You're going to see more and more desperation from more people because they don't have jobs. They're falling farther behind the curve. Uh, they can't feed their kids. Well, I'm sorry. Um, if I can't feed my grandson or if I can't get health care for my grandson, I'll take matters into my own hand. I mean, that's not a threat. That's that's a fact. I'm mm-hmm. not going to sit by and idly watch it. This is why I write the rant is to keep some of that anger. Issue down. Sure, sure. You know, and, um, you know, as we do see these things happen, um, it almost makes a person kind of like, I guess that's where a lot of people are watching TV and different things like that. They want to divest out of reality and kind of just get away from it. The all. reality shows. Sure. And, uh, those are staged. Yeah. Um, keeping up with the Kardashians. Mm. <laughs> okay. I mean, there's, there's shows out there that you just sit there and you go, okay, 
I used to watch it for entertainment value. Most mm-hmm. of the time now when I'm TV, um, I'll watch a live sporting event, mm-hmm. mostly baseball, but I'll watch the live sporting event because that is my way of, of leaving it. Um, I, I, I like the stats. I like all the stuff that goes into it. But, boy, when you, you sit there and you watch what's going on, you're just going, um, in the real world, this is why there's so much fluff on the news shows. Mm-hmm. Because if they told you what was really happening, if they weren't in bed with the administration and, and are being threatened with the fact that, hey, if you put this out, the FCC is going to take your license. Well, I'm sorry, crime and Italy. The FCC shouldn't have that power. Mm-hmm. If I am can be proven to be a traitor or a treasonous act to the United States, then you can take away my license. Otherwise, too bad. Mm-hmm. Um, but they put on this fluff, like, oh, we're going to have a, a contest uh, on Fox News at 8 o'clock in the morning on an obstacle course between a guy and a gal. Okay. Yeah. Great. Or show Geraldo riding to work on his bicycle because it's bike to work day. Mm-hmm. Anybody that rides a bicycle in New York needs to have their head examined. <laughs> but I mean, it's fluff. It's the substance continues to decline, decline, decline. But they want the sensational news story. Oh, this guy crossed the Mexican border and is held in prison, and he's a marine because he he got trapped and couldn't turn around well you know what if they're that inattentive you shouldn't have weapons anyway Mm -hmm. um number one but number two why don't we treat those people that are of mexican descent the same way they don't they're not americans they shouldn't have american rights Mm -hmm. true only legalized citizens should have american rights they're taking those little rights away. And they've take what they're doing is they're taking it away from Americans, but they're giving it to foreigners. Um it, it, it's a double edged sword. It's gonna come back and bite us. I love it. They can't investigate Benghazi, they can't prosecute Fast and Furious, but our wonderful attorney general's office yeah. indicts six mm-hmm. Chinese for cyberspace hacking well you know if you're dumb enough to put something on cyberspace my argument with the sec in 1986 when they were promoting online banking you put it in cyberspace there is no guarantee all oh, this is secure no it isn't somebody somewhere is going to be smart enough maybe miss me if i can't do it it may be barry but somebody if you put it out there somebody is going to be able to access it mm-hmm. because they have and that was a big argument that I had, and I'm, I still believe that. Uh, anybody that does online banking is asking for trouble. Two other questions I'm going to sure. ask you, Michael, and I'll, and I'll let you do final thoughts. Sure. When do you think there will be a person or woman or people that will start standing up for what the Constitution says? And if they do, what will happen in our country? I think you're already seeing it. I think you saw it in the, in the Nevada case. Mm-hmm. I think this is why they pulled back. They didn't anticipate that the Bundy case would garner as much attention. Now, is Bundy a jerk? Absolutely. I I, I don't disagree with him on that. Mm -hmm. But since when is being a jerk a crime in this country? Mm -hmm. And the thing was, he and his family had a longer standing agreement than the BLM has been around. Mm -hmm. The BLM should take that into consideration. Also, the BLM confiscated some cattle, Mm -hmm. and they killed them. There's people languishing in prison for burning their own cars. I remember you talked about that. Yeah. Yeah. And or, or, Or for burning their own house or burning a garage or whatever, destruction of their own property. Well, they were doing it for for insurance claim. There's people that are in prison that didn't do that. There's people in prison that didn't file the claim. They were torqued off. So they destroyed it. Mm-hmm. Okay, I can see their their point of anger, but it, it makes things uh, unworkable for the government when all of a sudden they go there with 175 guys and 10,000 show up and are aiming rifles back at them. 
They don't like that too much. You don't bring a knife to a gunfight. True. But they weren't anticipating it, so they were going to beat him in court. Well, they're right there. Nobody can print enough money like they can to keep up with them. They can they can run a court case until they bleed you dry, and you have to give up. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, second question. What is God telling you? What are you seeing? What are you being showed? What do you What do you see? I never thought I'd be saying this. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll say even uh, three years ago, I wouldn't have put myself in this position. Um, but the the warning signs are there. Mm-hmm. And when I listen to people talk about the blood moons or warnings, I don't have to. What I do is I, I look at news reports that I just uh, will go to uh, Money News or someplace like that on the website and just look at the stories that are running and and say, okay, wait a minute. Um, these are not highlight stories. But when I put story A, which says the unemployment rate is down to 6.3% and they got there by dropping 806 thousand Americans off of the workforce participation role. Mm-hmm. And then I turn around and I see that Americans don't have money there, or that there's a credit implosion or that the wages are stagnant. And yet inflation went up one and a half percent. If you're not making that one and a half percent this last quarter, then you're in trouble. Well, then I look, wait a minute, this one declined, manufacturing declined or the economy contracted now they're saying and i'm going okay who said it why did they say it what's their facts i'll go back and access the reports that they filed originally Mm -hmm. and read that information and see if the story headline if the actually gave me the true facts and a lot of times i can pick up other information so to say that it's going to happen in six months no Uh, one of the things that they're real fond of is the fiscal cliff Mm mm-hmm Okay, let's let's turn that. I, I don't believe that. If you take and look at the stock market, it had dropped. It was dropping. It isn't a true level. They bolstered it by printing money and shoving it into the financial institutions because that was where the crisis originated. Mm-hmm. And they had no nothing to do with it but put it into the stock market. So what you really have right now is we are still scraping along at a bottom because the only thing that has really come back – to pre-recession levels is the stock market. And what the only thing I can compare it to is the sinkhole. Okay. What's going to happen is there's nothing holding that up. When that collapses, when the credit line or whatever evaporates and is no longer there, when interest rates rise and you see the fallacy of, you see the hot air that we're standing on, you're going to fall into it. And this is what happens. All of a sudden, you'll wake up, you're sleeping, you'll wake up the next morning, and your house is in a sinkhole, and you're still in the bedroom. Mm-hmm. Or your cars have gone into the sinkhole. Something that you have a value is now worthless because it's in the sinkhole, and there's no way of getting out. There's no way of getting out because we have no resources left. We have no uh, reserve in any way, shape, or form to draw on. We have taken everything down. Hmm. Any final thoughts? The question is whether it's better to run into the cliff at, uh, or fall off of the top of a cliff yeah. or to wake up at the bottom of a sinkhole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I I really do. I, I think we're going to have a tough problem. But what what I've been able to do is, is attach that uh, to what's in what I have been showing um, or what I've, I've been, I, I can see in my own small way. Um, I'm not Amos. I'm not a prophet in any way, shape, or form. I just know that when things don't feel right, I have the wherewithal to look and keep looking to look, find out why. I pick at things. I pick at the details. That was why I was a good auditor, quite frankly. But right now it's different. I don't know the timing on it. Because I don't know what the powers that be, the governments and stuff, for instance, that do run the financials, I don't know what they're they're seeing or what they're gauging and how bad. 
they don't yet understand when they took a quarter point off of the interest rates, that was a bullet out of the gun. But when they've got the rates down to zero, I mean, they dropped them all at once, as far low as they can really go and have any kind of a return at all. If it's less than inflation, and that's the printing press run that they're doing, they're just making the hole deeper. They're making that sinkhole that much deeper, and we've got to figure out a way to get out of it. And I don't know if I don't know of anybody that really does because businesses are being strangled by red tape. Um, the pri- the individual is afraid. The entrepreneur that would normally start a business, he's afraid right now because there's no safety net. Mm-hmm. So where do you go? And you know, I'd rather find somebody to work for, but that's not that's that's not real life anymore because again, the jobs that they're hiring are part time or or temporary situation there, there's no guarantee that it's still going to be there in 5 10 15 years or that you can make a career out of it in that area.